This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. To talk more about the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali, we are joined by two guests, Ishmael Reed, educator, writer, activist. His new book is The Complete Muhammad Ali. Reed is recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award and is currently a visiting scholar at the California College of the Arts. And in New York, we're joined by poet and professor Elizabeth Alexander. She is the director of creativity and free expression at the Ford Foundation, former chair of African American studies at Yale University, author of the poem Narrative Ali, written from the perspective of Muhammad Ali. Uh, Elizabeth Alexander recited the inaugural poem when President Obama first took office in 2009. We welcome you both to Democracy Now. Um, Ishmael Reed, why don't we begin with you? Um, can you start off by sharing your reaction to hearing of the death of Muhammad Ali and talk about why you spent years researching his life? Well, I think that uh, his death uh, sort of represents a great tragedy uh, because uh, this is a man who stayed in the ring too long, was abandoned by his entourage, uh, was broke and suffering from brain damage when he fought his last two fights, according to Angelo Dundee, his uh, trainer. It's a great tragedy, and without the intervention of uh, his current wife, I think he might, be, might, might have died a long time ago. So I'm very skeptical about this adulation that's happening now, because none of those people who are praising him wanted to rescue him or try to intervene when, for example, he was suffering horrible physical damage uh, from taking punches from people like Larry Holmes. So I think that uh, this is a great tragedy. I think that uh, not enough attention has been given to the influence of the Nation of Islam on Muhammad Ali. You uh, played some of his speeches. Those speeches were taken right out of Elijah Muhammad's a message to the black man. So I think that uh, this is a great flaw and what I'm hearing uh, from commentators about his death is that uh, without the Nation of Islam, nobody would have ever heard of Muhammad Ali. Mm. Ishmael, can you start off by giving us a thumbnail sketch of Muhammad Ali's life? Well, uh, he grew up in a middle-class home. Uh, his father, uh, Cash, was a great provider. He was a uh, man who earned a living by painting uh, signs. Uh, I went to Louisville and talked to some of the people who uh, knew uh, Muhammad Ali when he was growing up. So he lived a relatively comfortable life. Uh, I also interviewed uh, Rachman, his uh, brother, who uh, said the same thing, that uh, they were provided for. And uh, I'm always uh, 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 sort of like offended by the fact that uh, some of the biographers of Muhammad Ali dismissed Cash as some kind of uh, alcoholic or uh, some ne'er-do-well. Uh, this is a man who lived up to his responsibilities. Uh, I interviewed uh, Ed Hughes, the late Ed Hughes, who was uh, Muhammad Ali's oldest friend. And he talked about how Muhammad Ali had the gift of gab and could spout and express himself and how he's very generous, would give people uh, whom he didn't know. For example, in, in the Philippines, uh, he gave a man $25,000. Uh, so he's very generous with his money and uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, giving to charities. So I think he'll be remembered as somebody with a big heart. But on the other hand, he had, uh, you know, hangers on and parasites and people who uh, conned him, uh, took his money, uh, got him uh, involved in uh, uh, criminal enterprises, used his name. So this is a great tragedy. This is a—, a a kid who had a big heart and was just exploited uh, all the way up to the last fight, or the second last fight, uh, when he fought uh, Larry Holmes, where he was shortchanged uh, money that was uh, owed to him for that fight. And the attorney who was suing Don King, when he heard that uh, Muhammad Ali was swindled, he burst out into tears. So it, it's a sad story. In 1964, Malcolm X spoke out in support of Muhammad Ali after the press began to attack him for mm -hmm. joining the Nation of Islam. 
Mm -hmm. He's never been involved in any trouble. His record is clean. He's actually an all-American boy or an all-African boy, as you will. And uh, the, an effort on the part of the press to attack him actually hurts America all over the world. I've gotten letters from countries myself, foreign countries, uh, expressing uh, confidence and pride in the clean image that Cassius represents. And I think to attack him, especially on religious grounds, would be most destructive to America's image abroad. My advice always to Brother Cassius is that he never do anything that will in any way tarnish or take away from his image as the heavyweight champion of the world because I frankly believe that Cassius is in a better position than anyone else to restore the uh, uh, a, a sense of uh, racial pride to not only our people in this country but all over the world and uh, he is trying his best to live a clean life and, and uh, project a clean image but despite this you find the press is constantly trying to paint him as something other than what he actually is he doesn't smoke he doesn't drink uh, in fact, if he, had, if he was white, they would be referring to him as the all-American boy, like they used to refer to Jack Armstrong. So that's Malcolm X uh, talking about Muhammad Ali, uh, the fact that he had converted Ishmael Reed. And over the weekend, you know, the media was filled with images and discussions of Muhammad Ali. And there were a number of photos that would go by uh, of him standing with Malcolm X, but there was almost no reference. I mean, I didn't see any reference to that relationship. Uh, talk about his decision to join the Nation of Islam, his relationship with Malcolm X. Well, you know, uh, I think it's a mistake to say that Malcolm X recruited um, uh, Muhammad Ali for the Nation of Islam. Actually, it was a man named Abdul Rahman, whose name before that was Sam X. Uh, Muhammad Ali saw Rahman selling copies of uh, Muhammad Speaks in uh, Florida and approached him and uh, told uh, Rahman that he'd been reading Muhammad Speaks, and it was uh, Rahman who invited him into the nation. Now, many people talk about that fam famous uh, expression, no Vietnamese ever call me uh, the N-word, as they say nowadays. Uh, that was created by Rahman. They were uh, at a house— the Muslim women were cooking uh, for uh, the, the gathering there, and uh, the reporters were outside. Ali comes in and says, ask Rahman what he should tell them, and uh, Rahman says, tell them that no Vietnamese ever called you Now, So that's one of the mythologies that we hear about uh, Ali's career. Now, back up some, he also was following the precedent of Elijah Muhammad, who's some sort of boogeyman, even though he organized people brought in $70 million a year, started cattle farms, which were sabotaged by racists, and was engaged in international trade. I mean, that was the other side to it. I mentioned that, the criminals who were involved in the Nation of Islam. But Elijah Muhammad refused to fight in World War II. He was a conscientious objector in World War II because he would not fight the Asiatic black man. This is where Ali gets his idea of not fighting the Vietnamese. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Elijah Muhammad went around the country making pro-Japanese speeches. They tried to get him for sedition. They couldn't get him for sedition, so they got him as a draft dodger, and he spent five years uh, in prison. So uh, th a lot of people don't understand that when uh, the Japanese Navy de defeated what was considered a white nation, the Soviet Union, uh, in 1905, or Russia, Tsarist Russia, excuse me, in 1905, there was rejoicing all over the country. People like W. Du Bois, uh, George Schuyler, and others praised this as a victory of a black nation over a white uh, nation, imperialist nation. So this was the kind of background that led to Muhammad Ali refusing to uh, fight in war, uh, the Vietnam War. This is a clip from the documentary The Trials of Muhammad Ali, featuring Abdul Rahman Muhammad, uh, who helped introduce Ali to the Nation of Islam. Cassius Clay was training for the Sonny Liston fight for the heavyweight championship. I wanted him to be a registered Muslim. When you come into Islam, we write a letter saying we believe in the teachings and we put our slave name in the letter. Those names the slave master had when they owned our ancestors. So he wrote his letter, sent it off to Chicago, and then they sent back what we call X. He became Cassius X. And then the promoters 
they was trying to get Ali to denounce the religion. And they told Ali, you got to get rid of the Muslim cooks. And Captain Sam, that's me, and denounce that religion, otherwise there ain't going to be no fight. Well, Ali had been training all his life for the fight for the heavyweight championship, so that's some of scare man to death. I said, oh, man, don't believe that. I said, money is the white man's God. And I said, you're the only one who can make any money for him. I said, hold to your belief. After Cassius Clay changed his name to Muhammad Ali, many news outlets refused to use his name. The debate over his name even extended into the ring. During a 66 interview with Howard Cosell, Muhammad Ali accused challenger Ernie Terrell of being an Uncle Tom for refusing to call him Muhammad Ali. You continue to be unafraid of this man. Yeah, uh, I'd like to say something right here. You know, Cassius Clay, yes. Why do you want to say Cassius Clay when Howard yes. Cosell and everybody is calling me Muhammad Ali? Now, why you got to be the one of all people who's color to keep saying Cassius Clay? Uh, Howard Cosell is not the one who's going to fight you. I am. <laughs> you uh, make it really you... hard on yourself now. Well, why uh, don't you keep the thing in the sport angle? Why don't you call me my name, man? Well, what's your name? You told me your name was Cassius Clay a few I years ago. I never told you my name was Cassius Clay. My name is Muhammad Ali. You uh, just acting just like an old Uncle Tom. Another flawed palace. I'm going to punish you. Let me tell you something, man. You ain't got no back off of me. me. Don't back call me no me. Uncle Tom. Man. That's what you are, an Uncle Tom. Why are you going to call me Uncle Tom? I ain't gonna, nothing you heard me? me no just Uncle back Tom. off of me. And so, ladies and Uncle gentlemen, Tom? as the two contestants prepare for you battle wait, well, right now. Back off of me, man. Back off of me, man. Another interview has been recorded for posterity as the two gentlemen continue to promote the fight. So that was Howard Cosell with Muhammad Ali and Ernie Terrell. And um, Ishmael Reed, in the midst of that fight, uh, which Muhammad Ali won, as he was punching Ernie Terrell, he was saying, what's my name? What's my name? Is that right? Well, I think that's uh, the showmanship that uh, we expected of uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Floyd Patterson recalls an incident where he uh, ran into Muhammad Ali and called him Cassius Clay, and uh, he wasn't offended. He says, perfectly all right if you call me Cassius Clay. But I think some of those uh, antics that we hear from uh, Muhammad Ali was to sort of like uh, juice the gate up. He got these antics from uh, Gorgeous George. L many people don't remember Gorgeous George, who was this flamboyant uh, wrestler. Uh, and according to Rahman Ali, uh, Muhammad Ali had seen Gorgeous George uh, in uh, in Louisville. Gorgeous George used to get up in these flamboyant uh, costumes, and he was like the villain. He was a heavy, and he boasted a lot. I think uh, Donald Trump is influenced by both Ali and Gorgeous George. He played the heavy to sweeten the gate, and uh, he sort of like played at androgyny. But nobody's going to pick 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 a fight with uh, a gorgeous George or question his manhood. Uh, Clark Blaze, who was a great uh, French-Canadian writer, I interviewed him, and he said when he heard that the heavyweight champion of the world was calling himself pretty, he knew there had been a change in the culture of boxing. And his resistance— now, 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 one more thing, uh, Amy, I wanted to mention this. Ernie Terrell was considered the mob fighter. There was a—my book was published in Canada. And so, uh, some of my uh, passages have a Canadian emphasis. There was a showdown between organized crime, which ran boxing up to the Nation of Islam, introduced an organization called Main Bouts. The showdown happened in Toronto. Uh, Ali and Herbert Muhammad were warned that if uh, Ali didn't take a dive and didn't, uh, you know, fall to uh, Ernie Terrell, he would wind up at the bottom of Lake Michigan. Now, according to George Chevallo, whom uh, Ali fought, uh, the man who made the threat was paid a visit by the Nation of Islam. And uh, you want to know what happened after that, you can read my book. 